Hey everybody, this is Hercules Pedics founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Epic Illustrated number 17, continuing our long-standing examination of this fine magazine from the early 80s. We uh, start off with a very nice cover by Tim Conrad. It's amazing in the three years Epic has been around, we've seen Tim Conrad just evolve by leaps and bounds. And now he's just this like, damn good painter. Um, he was a little rough when he started, but man, the progress he's, this guy's made. Um, pretty nice sci-fi cover. Uh, still hawking champagne. Got the contents page, the overview of all the creators. And here we start. Chapter one and two of Generation Zero by Pepe Moreno. We've seen Pepe Moreno before in Epic. He's the uh, European artist. I believe he's Spanish. And um, this is his new series. It's going to run seven parts. And it's a post-apocalyptic adventure kind of weird it's almost like um like for teens like it takes place in this crazy violent post-apocalyptic world but the three main heroes like they crack jokes all the time uh they're really against killing nothing bad ever seems to really happen it's i don't know very strange because it does seem like it's gonna be this very serious post-apocalyptic world of violence and danger and we the first few pages, we just have this almost documentary-like footage of how the world came to be. And it's how you'd imagine. Uh, we've used up all our resources, uh, mostly oil. Uh, all the countries were squabbling over it. And in all this tension, where the world got, has gone a shit, um, there's a computer era, error. And uh, the nuclear war happens just because some microchip that costs less than a buck malfunctioned and you the united states and russia uh started a nuclear war it was a limited nuclear war because they caught kind of someone figured out what the glitch was and uh, but still it was enough to like destroy half of the nations of the world and probably half the people leaving most of the world a poisonous radioactive wasteland um but the earth is resilient and pockets of uh, the earth have like healed themselves. There's still lots of areas though with these radioactive clouds. So uh, the main story begins in Iceland. Just wanted to comment on this beautiful colors. I don't know if that's supposed to be like the Aurora Borealis or something, but apparently in Iceland, these people, um, private, interests built this haven for survivors and it's you know um safe and the radiation can't get in there which i find odd because they have a big hole into the <laughs> atmosphere so i don't understand how come radiation just doesn't they're not poisoned but i guess they figured out something so the president is talking to the council this old guy and he's basically saying guys we gotta like explore the world. We can't just stay here in our hidey hole. We've got to see if there's more survivors, what's going on in the outside world. One of the, most of the council members are against it. And one of them even mentions like, oh, so we could end up like your brother who totally became evil. So I guess the president's brother years ago went out into the world and uh, the rumors are that he's turned into like a, a tyrant. So now we're introduced to, uh, I believe his name's Juan Falcón, and it's the president's nephew, the son of that, uh, that uh, guy who went away, the brother who went away and became a tyrant. And he's kind of a ne'er-do-well, doesn't really fit in. He's a rebel. He's always getting into fights. He's fucking people's wives. And, uh, he gets called to the president's office and his two buddies are there too. They're the same way. They're always getting into trouble. Cube, his uh, kind of nerdy smart friend and dancer, who's kind of like Juan. You know, he's a ladies man, always getting drunk, causing barroom brawls and stuff. 
So he tells them the plan. He says, guys, you don't really fit in here, but I think you'll be perfect for this mission because of that. Um, we've become so like kind of settled here. No one's uh, really good at, we're, we're not adventurers anymore, but you guys still have this independent spirit that'll make you good adventurers. So there's this awesome ship and they're like, we want you to just go out and see what's out there. And after like a, a month or two of training, learning about the ship, combat training, all this stuff. And uh, they head out. And the whole time they're just cracking wise. They're, they're really good friends who just have a, a funny banter all the time amongst themselves. So they find themselves in New York. And they're kind of amazed because a lot of rumors have said that New York is totally gone, but apparently it's not. And they land on a bridge and they start exploring. They don't see anyone for a long time, but they are being watched, we see. We see this little cryptic panel of a, someone's monitoring them on a video. Juan Falcone mentions how, you know, he's kind of sad. He used to live in New York City. And he's kind of sad. He says, hey guys, can I just be alone for a second? I just want to think about, you know, you know, my mom died here or she could be alive, but doubtful. And while he's alone, these kind of, kind of mutants come out and they're talking like weird Christian stuff. They're like unclean, unholy, condemned by the eyes of God. And they attack him and he, Juan screams. So his friends come a running and they're tearing him apart. But then, kind of fortuitously, acid rain starts. That's a constant hazard in this world. Every now and then it rains and it just, it's like acid. Look, It's like melting these guys. So they run over to Juan with a, a car, I think it's a car door, and they shield him and they get him into this building. But the rain is letting up and the mutants are still across the street. They're holed up across the street and they're like, oh, they're gonna attack us any minute as soon as that rain stops. So Juan remembers that there's a subway entrance in in this building. So he, him and his buddies go down there. Juan's not doing too good, they gotta prop him up. And this guy comes out of nowhere and says, follow me, trust me, I'll help you out. So he's this doctor who's turned, I believe this is Grand Central Station, I think. Turns it into a big, like, field hospital. He takes care of as many people as he can in this harsh world. And he takes care of Juan and finds out that Juan is, like, going to die. Um, the mutants attacked him and he's got infected. He doesn't have the natural antibodies that people who live in this, you know, horrible wasteland, you know, irradiated world have developed. So he's not immune. So he's like, you know what? Um, before I die, I'm gonna get the fucker who's been controlling those mutants. Because he informs them that there's this guy who's like a crazy priest type guy. Using all the video monitors throughout the city, he's been like commanding the mutants to follow him and worship him and also do whatever he wants. So uh, they come up to this, what they think is his building because they figure this used to be a, a transmitting station. I think it's an old television station. It's like NBC or something. And this uh, camera's on them and a gun comes out. <clears throat> they shoot the gun and then they go underground to like come up through the bottom. And the priest is like telling all of his mutants throughout the city, he's like, the unclean are here, converge here and attack them and kill them. So there's some like laser security system. They're trying to get by it, but they don't have much time because the mutants are coming up behind them. So they gas the mutants. Once again, look at these colors. <laughs> Peppa Marino is really good. And, uh, and they get through the laser uh, defense system. They confront the priest and uh, they basically disarm him and Juan's gonna kill him. But Cube says, 
The only true monster in the city is him. Don't let him make you one as well. So these guys are good guys. They don't even want to kill this villainous guy. But then from behind, the priest has a dagger like hidden in his hand. It goes click. And he's going to kill him. So Dancer smashes his head and it explodes into circuitry. It turns out it's a robot. So they figure out that, you know, the um, this robot was left by the last inhabitants of this place to protect the computers and stuff. So they blow up everything. So all the TV screens blink out. Now the mutants have no guidance. Wow, that really looks like it could be Charles Burns right there. I never noticed that. Maybe with uh, mixed with Basil Wolverton. And uh, they're just wandering around confused now. And then the doctor wishes them well and says, sorry about, you know, I couldn't cure you. So Juan's got good spirits. He's just like, whatever, I got a good ship. And uh, as they're flying away from New York City, uh, Juan takes the a flower that Dancer brought with him. Dancer has the sentimental attachment to like potted flowers. Wherever he goes, he likes to have a flower growing. And uh, he says, hey, Dancer, give a dying man a last request. I want to throw this rose out. Um, maybe someone down there, a place where nothing will bloom. Someone will at least find this and feel a little hope. And we see an old woman find the flower. And I don't know, maybe we'll find out, but that could be his mother, his long lost mother, I don't know. This is uh, this graphic artist named Will Brown. He's like a graphic designer, painter type. I don't think he's ever done comics before. And this is so typical of like epic stories. You've already, I've already shown you like five stories just like this. It seemed to be the zeitgeist of the early 80s, maybe because 1984 was coming up. But we're obviously in this typical totalitarian future. We got the big brother guy here on posters. And this mime shows up. And he's like phasing through the floor, the, the ground. So obviously something's weird, like his magic or something. So he's sneaking around. The guards are checking on everyone. And uh, he's drawing mustaches on the big brother posters. He finds it very funny. And all the people notice, though. The citizens notice, and they're laughing. And that's when the guard finally notices what's going on. And the mimes basically just playfully like, what you gonna do? Come catch me. He's mocking him, you know, he's jumping up, making faces at him. And then he runs off. So the guards are like, you know, like, I need assistance. There's a, there's a, whatever, dissident. And they corner the mime and they beat the shit out of him with their truncheons. And he's dead. I guess uh, they predicted that facial hair would be big in the future again. All these guys seem to have lots of facial hair. And as they're dragging him away, the pools of blood that are left behind, all these other mimes grow out of it. <laughs> so there you go. Pretty heavy stuff. That's a heady brew. Okay, here we have the last chapter, unfortunately, even though it's great, but I'm sad it's the last chapter of Abraxas and the Earth Man by Rick Veitch. And where we left off last time, um, some of our protagonists were riding around in this giant using a spacesuit as almost like a organic spaceship. He's dead, the guy in the suit. And Rotwing is there and all the other captains are there. This is what they do after the whaling season. They all convene and then they head back to their home world, Caligul. I guess all the captains are from Caligul. And, uh, but uh, Rotwing is inspired because this giant of this alien race, this giant alien race, he had a, a laser pistol. So to them, it's like this amazing weapon. It's just like a laser cannon, which they've never seen the likes of before. So they're like, Rotwing is like with this new weapon, we can finally take down that motherfucker Abraxas, his nemesis. So they do a test and they shoot the giant and they blow a hole in him, a huge hole in him. So it's, it's a very powerful weapon. And so uh, Rotwing says, okay, I need to fix on Abraxas right now. Now that we got this weapon, I'm gonna kill that motherfucker. So there's Luxu surgeons start messing with uh, 
Falco's head, the Earthman, the other Earthman here. And basically trying to do what they did to uh, Isaac, our protagonist. So he can, his brain will be advanced and he can find a, a Braxis. But then um, Sphinx, Falco's lover, and uh, she attacks Rotwing and she says, Stop, you're killing him. And she says, Throw her, throw her in iron, irons. And so then Falco tells the vision he sees. He sees Abraxas floating peacefully with a large herd, and they're over the, the diamond floors, which is an area of this planet with all the diamonds, has diamonds all over. So Rotwing's like, come on, man, let's do this. We're going to have us a great uh, hunting expedition. And he says, wait, you swore that you'd get me a body if I helped you. And Rotwing says, oh, I'll get you a body if I'll go. I have one, I have one lined up for ye. This Lexus Surgeons will take care of it. So now we see the new being that Isaacs, the Earthman, and Abraxas, this is like their spirit form, their soul state, if you will. And this is the combined soul state of Abraxas and John Isaacs, the, um, the Earthman. So this is, Abraxas is getting very trippy now. <laughs> and uh, I do have to say, like, the art is even better in this issue than, and the colors. It's like, I always thought it was amazing art, this uh, Abraxas series. This one even seems better. Like, he's pulling out all the stops. Like, this beautiful thing. So we, we he's getting very, like, spiritual now and, like, hippy-dippy. So this thing is called the Aeon. And basically the Aeon is the devourer of awareness who strips all memory from souls before sending them back to live another life. Because, you know, when people were reincarnated, they don't remember their last life. Um, I guess some people claim they can, but they're liars. And so this is all, we see all the souls. We see the loon, if you remember, the humans that were inside of Abraxas's belly with their skin off, just like John. And we also see that giant alien who they just blew a hole through. So they're all heading to Aeon. They're all going to have their memories wiped. And so they can be deposited into a new life form, like reincarnation. But then all of a sudden, the soul state, the Isaac and Abraxas soul state, I guess it's a super powerful thing where they save all the souls from getting sucked up into the Aeon. And they put them all in the whales. But it's a very benevolent, benevolent spirit. So they only put them in whales that agree. That, uh, that you know, they kind of psychically look in their head. So, um, but because of this birth ecstasy of them melding with these souls, they don't notice the, the whaling captains sneaking up on them. And they attack with that laser cannon they kill a bunch of whales not a Braxis yet but then finally Rot Wang this gets his revenge and when a Braxis comes up he kind of recognizes Rot Wang he's a, a smart whale Rot Wang shoots him right in the head right between the eyes and a Braxis falls out of the sky Rot Wang is thrilled he's like vengeance is mine and it was, everything was worth it. My brain cracking in half and my sinews and losing my leg and my eye, it's all worth it. He's so happy he finally got to kill Abraxas. And then, the, the I'm sorry, let me just say, the other captains are kind of like, Captain, you're not even noticing. These whales can now focus their songs into weapons. So the whales are blasting all the captain ships out of the sky. <clears throat> Wild Wing doesn't give a shit. He's got his revenge. He really doesn't care what happens. They could all die for all he cares. Even he could die. He'd die happy. But then Falco shows up. And look what the bastard had those Lexu surgeons do. They killed Sphinx and put his head on her body. <clears throat> they chopped off her head. The bastards. So he attacks Rotwing. 
but Rotwing totally runs him through with his harpoon and kills him. And he realizes that Abraxas is still holding on to life. So he dives down with his harpoon and just starts stabbing him. And that's when John Isaacs emerges. He says, how could it be that you're scrambling out of Abraxas' blowhole? <clears throat> Excuse me. And he said that it's the Zlexus do doing. They helped the whale and me merge into a symbiotic entity. Your attack forced that entity into this body. Right now, I am Abraxas. So he's like, if killing you kills Abraxas for good, then I'm going to kill you. But then the Zlexu surgeons all show up. And uh, they're there to heal Abraxas because he's not quite dead. They take the diamonds from this floor and they kind of put it as a suture on his wound. And not only does it heal him, but it also, you know, the, the diamond helps him focus his energies. So in a way, he's stronger than before. So even though he's been beaten, he's like, well, I'll at least, you know, fuck you over one last time. I'm going to rip your skin to shreds because John Isaacs really wants his skin returned to him. He doesn't like walking around like a like an open wound. But now John Isaac doesn't care. He says, my skin is meaningless to me now. I found that there's much more to a man than mere flesh. And with his new powers, he pulls Rotwing's soul out of his very body. And it's this disgusting, it almost looks like he's a turd man. Like he's made out of poop. That's how like soiled and tarnished his soul is. So he throws him into the Aeon where he will be erased and reborn. Hopefully he's a better individual. So now Braxis is floating around. Staub um, is now in uh, this whale. Everyone's kind of teamed up with whales. Sphinx is now, you know, her soul lives on. And <clears throat> oh yeah, Staub was the first mate who uh, died a few issues back. And uh, Falco and Sphinx are like, you know, we're going to stay behind and raise a family. So they're really in love and, you know, but John Isaac's got a bigger mission than that. The two um, alien women, giant, giant women aliens, sh the schmooze show up and John puts them in, tells them the score. He says, yeah, go, you know, join up with some whales and their, um, their ex lover well, reluctant lover. He's in a whale already, so they become whales. And they're like, we want to play. And they basically start mauling him sexually. And he's like, oh, shit. So this guy can't win. Even though he's been reincarnated in a whale, he's still got these women pestering him constantly for sex, which he's not really that into. He's like the Mr. Roper of the story. He just is really <laughs> doesn't care about fucking at all. But these women are constantly hectoring him for it. So, um, it's pretty hippy dippy. <laughs> I was trying, you know, he's explaining what happened, but, um, if you reach back into the whales and ancestral past, you will remember the great migration. And that's when the whales migrated across the galaxy. They carried with them the seed of the Zlexu, the seed that spawned all the races of men. By surgically attaching this jewel to Abraxas's giblet, we have created a doorway into his body through his subconscious mind. And I don't know what this is. If he just, it almost looks like computer generated art, which I don't even think they had back then <laughs> at this, um, you know, high resolution. Oh, it's supposed to be DNA. In the great th scheme of things, the Zlexu have been entrusted with the seed in its many different evolutionary forms. The whales were one of the first forms we gave it. DNA, that is. And so now they're going to, re they're going to return to Earth. And this is the one thing I don't like about this whole series. The Zlexu say, uh, will you choose a name by which me by which we may know you now that you're a new species. And he says, call me Ishmael. <laughs> I don't know why. There's no real reason why he would say that. 
and uh, back on Earth, the whales are singing. And we see that prophecy song from the first issue in which basically the whales who have been stuck on Earth since the Great Migration, I guess Earth's gravity is higher than all the other planets they went to. That's why they're stuck in the ocean. But once again, they say, but not until a man from Earth journeys to the whale planet and meets Abraxas will we be delivered from the zones of the sea. So that's where they're heading. They're going to change the whole destiny of everything. They're going to unite men and whale on Earth and throughout the universe. So that's the end of Abraxas and the Earth Man. And uh, I, didn't, I think this has been collected by Rick Veitch's own publishing company. I've never seen a copy of it, though. I kind of would like it, like, just in one, you know, in a nice collection. Here we have The Return of Dr. Watchstop by Ken Macklin. Uh, typical stuff, you know, like scientific hijinks, you know, usually just a joke. Just beautiful art, though. Um, Ken Macklin uh, just really has this command of uh, his, art, his art tools. This one's silly. They're in this city that's abandoned, but it's like this amazing scientific city machine, basically. But it's abandoned. So all this was built to house like billions of people, but no one's there. And they're like, I wonder where they could have gone. But then the computer that runs the whole thing is like, alien presence confirmed, base will destruct in nine minutes. So I guess that's the joke. <laughs> Not much of a joke. This is pretty nice, uh, interesting. We have an article about Planet Comics, the Golden Age comic book. That was the first science fiction comic book. The first comic book dedicated solely to science fiction. It's written by Ron Goulart, a great uh, comic book historian. And uh, he's written some uh, good comic strips. Starhawks and such. These are pretty interesting, some of them. So here we have chapter three of Last of the Dragons. This year's getting really confusing. In fact, I don't think I'm confused. I think they, they're they they're misspeaking about some things. Because they they talk about um, Hokan. Hokan is the young priest from that uh, monastery who was horrified to find out that his fellow priests, some of his fellow priests, were training the peaceful, benevolent dragons how to kill, teaching them the arts of war, training them to be murderers. And he was horrified, and many of the other priests were horrified. Anyone who opposed him, this uh, shonen is the leader of this um, renegade group who wanna arm the, use the dragons as weapons, they killed every other priest except for a handful who run away, including Hokan. He made it. So it says that he escapes into the forest. We had a mystic vision. It was revealed to him that a clan of ninja would deliver the dragons from the corruption of the dissident priests. Therefore, he now goes to seek them out. And we see him offering a ninja this like gold clasp shaped like a dragon. And he's like, okay, that's a good, good payment. You got three of our warriors, our ninja warriors, for a fortnight. Then he, Hoken also decides to enlist the aid of Masanobu, the old swordsman that he met in the first issue when uh, he saw that samurai kill that dragon. So as he's going back to that area near the monastery, because that's where Masanobu hangs out, the dissident priests find him and they take him back to the monastery and torture him. And Hoken says, okay, I'll talk. I hired the ninja, ninja to combat you. And who else have you blathered to? The samurai Masanobu lives in the cave on the hillside. So they bring in one of the dragons to finish him off to make sure that his uh, training has worked. So these dragons, which are the most peaceful creatures in the world, are now these bloodthirsty, you know, savages. So these three priests, and um, apparently they escaped the massacre too. Because they say, like, we're with Hokan. Hokan said we would find you here. We ask your help. We sail 
to America with the next tide where the dragons will be safe. But we have learned the ninja will try to stop us. They have already killed a number of our brothers, including Hokan. Okay, I'm so sorry. I just figured it out. I'm dumb. So these are the horrible priests pretending to be like nice priests from the monastery like Hokan was. And they're going to basically get Masanubu to join them just like Hokan wanted. But of course, he'll be work working for these evil guys, not realizing. So they find these uh, European ships are there. Or American ships, sorry. And the priests tell them, hey guys, we want to load the cargo ourselves. Do you mind just like, I don't know, running off for an hour? We just don't want anyone to know what's in this cargo. And Masanobu is watching the whole thing. So the ninjas don't know about Masanobu beyond Hokan side. They just, as far as they know, they've got to stop this, these guys from corrupting the dragons. So they pop up, the three ninjas. Now this is the, the guy in uh, Takashi and his half-sister slash lover and, um, and some other ninja. We met them last issue. So all the dragons are in the hold and then the ninjas attack Masanobu. One of them goes to stop the ship and the other two are just kind of like, yeah, we can take care of this old guy. His bones are creaking. But they underestimate him because he's very skillful. And then um, the ninja who went down to the ship He's in front of this cave, and I guess most of the dragons they put, already put in the hold were like kind of young dragons and eggs of babies, but there's a mama dragon here. I kind of like the way the colors of this crazy mama dragon, quite pretty. Marie Severin colors. It's the same art team from the other uh, issues. I imagine you've probably, if you're watching this, you've watched the other epic videos I've done. So uh, same art team. So the ninja throws a bomb at the dragon, doesn't even phase him. And then the dragon just chomps down on him, kills him. And then Sneak gets into the boat hold. Because they only have room for one adult dragon, so they're taking this one. So the tide is rising, they must be off. And the sailors come back on the ship. And while they're taking off, the two ninjas are still fighting Masanobu. He hasn't, uh, he hasn't quit yet. He's uh, a lot more formidable than they thought. So uh, one of the ninjas, you know, drops a smoke bomb so he can escape. And when both of the ninjas are running down the mountain, one of them says, my ankle. So they're kind of laid up. So then the other ninja throws his bomb at the ship. The ship's already too far. He misses. And this ninja says ninjas are not captured because she sees Masanobu right behind them. Ninjas die and she kill, they kill her themselves. And I, as you could tell by my slipping with the, the pronouns, it's, it's Takashi's, you know, Takashi takes her mask off. It's his half sister slash lover. I mean, he was just raised with her. They adopted him. So it's, it's not that weird. <laughs> And Takashi's sad as hell. And uh, that's the end of this chapter. This is really nice. Uh, the Wanderer, or just Wanderer by Michael Kaluta, scripted by Archie Goodwin. I guess uh, Mike Kaluta drew this in 1973 for some magazine that went out of business before they could publish it. Um, when Archie Goodwin asked for a contribution, Michael Kluta said, hey, I got this old story. Um, I could uh, redraw some of it. And actually, maybe you could, you're a better scripter than me. I don't think Michael Kluta's ever written anything. He's probably not a very good writer, I imagine. Or he would have written something by now. So Archie Goodwin does a nice, like he always does. Archie Goodwin is a fine writer. And uh, it's basically about this guy who's been tortured in his dream state every night. He's like wraiths come to him and these just these nagging mocking spirits and just hound him 
But then one day, something different happens. He hears singing. And he finds this pretty little fairy lady. And she says, oh, you don't remember. The battle destroyed your memory. And um, she's trying to fill him in. But then she says, he's here. Run, my lord, run. And it's his brother, Vard. He's like an evil wizard type. And I like the way he draws this guy. Kind of like, almost like humorously. So he basically says like, oh, you've forgotten who you are. Our conflict was so great that you basically wiped it away and fell into this nice dull world where magic is in precious short supply. So this, both of these guys come from this like fantasy magical realm, like Narnia, but now they're on earth, our earth. So there's not a lot of magic there. So they're both, you know, not as strong as they used to be. And he challenges him, challenges him to fight. And when he, uh, I guess there's like some force field around Vard and it totally knocks him on his ass, but he's not dead. And then we see his little, uh, I guess familiars. Cause it's, we find out that this guy, uh, he kind of had the power of a God. It sounds like he was stronger than this guy even. And when he was that strong, he created all these creatures out of his own essence who became his companions and friends. And they're happy that like, oh wow. So he's still strong enough to um, survive Vard's attack. He still has a lot of his strength. And he tells him, this guy, sorry, his name is Hal. He says, you're a wizard, Hal, just like Vard. Only you were around long before him. And way back in those early days before you got too powerful for your own good and ours, you created us. So then Vard comes back, breaks in, and now what's his face? I already forgot his name. God damn it, I'm so bad at this. Hal. Hal unleashes all the ectoplasm, the very life essence of his friends and himself. And they attack Vard and rip him to shreds. This is some nice Kaluta. This is like... Just Kaluta is such a unique magical style, like drawing magic and stuff like this. Nobody does it like him. And this is early on in his career. I know we read you some of this, but a lot of it is just, you know, the, the foundation was like young Mike Kaluta. He wasn't at his peak yet. So we find out that uh, Halvard was this mighty wizard and he wanted to expel the dark side of his nature and he did but that fucked up everything because then the dark side of his nature became Vard and uh, Vard you know constantly tried to kill him so he says now I know we control our dark side not by separating it from us but by facing it without fear now I embrace that which was Vard and once more I am whole And uh, he breaks through the dimensional wall between Earth and his magical homeland. And he grabs up all his buddies and he takes them home. That's how it is. Here we have a little preview of uh, Walt Simonson's Star Slammers graphic novel, which is about to come out in 1983. And uh, I don't know, this is kind of a waste of paper. It's just an advertisement. I mean, I guess it's nice to see. I like Walt Simonson, but I kind of wanted to see a few panels. This is interesting, though. Um, Walt Simonson drew the original Star Slammers in 1969 when he was still a college student. And they, it's nice that they actually reprint the original. This is from 1969, Walt Simonson. Already pretty damn good. He was just a kid. Oh, this is nice. The introduction to the comics world. I think uh, Epic got him first. Scott Hampton, 
doing an adaptation of the Brothers Grimm. Scott Hampton, you know, did so many independent comics in the 80s. He's still doing stuff. I mean, just a few years ago, he did the American Gods adaptation that uh, P. Craig Russell did from Neil Gaiman's, Gaiman's book. This is, he, this is like young Scott Hampton, already fucking beautiful. Look at this stuff. The painting, the colors. So this is a great little tale where this guy who's got 13 kids, he's like, I need a godfather for this last one. I just don't have enough money to feed him. So he comes upon the first guy in the street he sees. And he says, P poor man, I pity you. I will hold your child at its baptism and I will look after it and make it happy upon the earth. And he says, who are you, sir? And he says, I am God. And he says, I do not want you to be my child's godfather. You let the rich live in plenty while the poor are starving. So then he walks on and he finds a tall, lean figure striding towards him. And this figure proclaims, let me be your child's godfather. And when he asks him who he is, he says, I am death. Under me, all men are equal. And uh, the father says, you shall be the grandfather. I'm sorry, Godfather. The day the boy came of age, his uh, Godfather, Death, gave him this special herb. And he said, you shall be a doctor. And you will be a great doctor because this herb will heal anyone as long as I have not claimed him. If I am standing at the head of someone in their sick bed, at the head of the bed, then give him the herb and it'll heal them. If I am sitting, standing, sorry, at their feet, at the end, feet, foot of the bed, then there, I claim them you, and just tell the people that you can't heal them and let them die because they're mine. So he becomes very wealthy with this herb. He's a great doctor. And one day he's summoned to the king and uh, he doesn't want this king to die because it's, so when he gets there, death is standing at the foot of the bed but he cheats death, he cheats his godfather, and he lifts the old sick man up and turns him around so that death was standing at the king's head. And then he gave the king some of the herb and healed him. Godfather death is furious. He says, I, I will forgive you this one trick only because I am your godfather, but if you ever try to cheat me again, I shall take you in the patient's place. But then the king's daughter falls sick and the king promises his kingdom and the hand of his daughter in marriage to anyone who can heal her. So once again, even though he knows that his godfather death is probably going to kill him for this, he sees how beautiful she is and he does the trick again. Just like, just he, forgetting about the godfather, you know, godfather death's uh, warning. So godfather death is pissed off and he says, come with me. And he takes him down into this underground cavern where there's thousands, many thousands of candles of all sizes burning in endless rows. These lights are the lives of mankind. The big ones belong to children, middle-sized ones to young adults in their prime, and the small ones are for very old people who don't have very long left to live. And he says, this is your candle. It's a little stub. And he says, please, dear Godfather, light a new candle for me. He says, that's impossible. A new candle can be lit only after one of the old ones has gone out. And he says, then set the old candle on top of a new one that will go on burning as the first one goes out. And Death pretends like he's going to do it, but he flicks his hand and just puts the candle out on top of the other candle. And the doctor falls dead. Don't fuck with Death. That's the moral of the story. So there you go. Another great issue. Epic Illustrated number 17. This is some good stuff. Um, I'm sad to see a Braxis go, but Generation Zero is kind of cool. Not nearly as cool, though, to be honest. But uh, I'll uh, hopefully see you next time here at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies. Thanks for watching.